he's got a plan. He's got a plan, y'all. Hallelujah. We're going to get our hearts and minds ready for the most important part of the service, and that is the Word of God. Coming from our own preacher. Pastor Lonnie Hart, let's stand to your feet. Stretch your hands this way and say, I'm ready, Lord. I'm ready, Lord, to hear the word. this morning. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. Amen. The goodness of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, this morning, we bow our knees, humble submit, Lord, and we exalt the worthy of the nature of mercy and your grace. We thank you for this precious body of Jeshua, the righteous of Christ. We have come into your presence this morning that we may Strengthen us and empower us and we may glorify your name in the midst of your people. Blessed be God. In the worthy name of Jesus the Christ, we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you and you may be seated. I give honor unto the Lord, the Father. give honor unto your pastor, Pastor Jerry Price. Thank God for her friendship over the years. Thank you for thanking her for the privilege of coming out to speak to you all. It's, a, it's good that we are here this morning. Uh, amen. Amen. It's good that we are here. I heard a comedian say one time that if I had not gotten this job as a comic and I was entertaining you, he said, I would be breaking in your house right now. Amen. It's good that you are here when you consider where else you could be had it not been for the goodness of the Lord. And so I thank God that he just counted us worthy to be included in his eternal plan. Amen. I'm, I'm not going to stay before you long. I say that all the time, and then I preach for an hour. And so, but this morning, let's just, I've, I've had a wonderful time this week, or these two nights. It's been refreshing, and uh, I'm so glad to see some familiar faces. Of course, I know your faces are familiar to me as well after coming up for so many years, but thank God for seeing the saints from New Life that made it up. And I'm so grateful that uh, Sister Hardin wanted to be here and Brother Miller was, was so compliant in that he just picked her up. He drove from Shelbyville to Lexington, uh, from Lexington to Cincinnati. And he didn't, because of the short notice, he wasn't able to get packed or do anything, but he picked her up and brought her here and was in service, and we drove back, amen, to uh, Shelbyville last night and uh, came back up this morning for service. And so I appreciate that. Somebody say amen. And I am inclined to believe that the Lord has blessed me was able to get a hold of him, and then I just believe if he had not have got a hold of her, I believe if he'd have got a hold of any of the others, he and Sister Karen, and then I believe some of the others would have done the same, and so I thank God for them, because we can call on them for anything, and they're always there, amen. I try not to tax them, I remember Elder Corey, when he was my pastor, he said this year, he said, take the wool, but leave the skin, amen. You understand? 
Uh, a lot of pastors take the wool, the skin, the blood, everything they can get. Amen. And so, but they have been so wonderful to pastor, and I thank God for every one of them. And amen. They all of them have beautiful testimonies. They're hesitant. They're hesitant to share and elaborate, but God has brought them and me and all of us from a mighty long way. Amen. He saw us from afar off, and I'm grateful for that. All right, I'm not going to, I said I wasn't going to keep you long, but we've got a few passages of Scripture that we need to read, and I'm going to can try to bring things and wrap things up and bring them to a conclusion. And uh, I want to read from Psalms 119, Psalms 119, and then we're going to go over to 2 Corinthians and read from 2 Corinthians in chapter 12. And I've wrestled with this passage for about a week now, and for me it's been a very difficult uh, passage to, uh, to uh, uh, learn and finding it, it, it's also difficult to speak from, so I covered my prayers this morning in, uh, I'm sorry, I, I've just, I've been, I've, I've just, the, the, between the song and the testimonies and everything that's been happening, I've, I've had a moment too, you know, man, I've, I've had a moment, and so I just want to get back up, so I'm going to try to keep everything in check, but God has just been so good. He's so good, so good. We're going to pick up in Psalm 61, and this psalm is an acrostic, meaning that um, every section begins with a letter of the alphabet. It's like going A, B, C, D. And so here we're picking up in uh, verse 61. And he says, my soul fainteth for the salvation that I hope in thy word. My eyes f uh, fall for thy word. Uh, fail, I'm sorry, fail. Saying, when wilt thou, thou comfort me? And verse 63 says, for I am become like what? Somebody read for me. I am become like a bottle in the smoke, yea, huh. Psalm 119, yes, verse 61, 63. No wonder I said, no, no wonder I'm struggling. I'm in Psalm 181. Hallelujah. I was, I was, I was seeing that it wasn't coming together because the verse that I wanted <laughs> was not coming up. I thought, no, that should have been that third verse, 67. All right, if you will, uh, somebody read. Brother Miller, somebody just pick up and start reading at Psalm 65, 119, verse 65. Amen. I got tears in my eyes. I'm sorry. I can't see. Uh-huh. For I have believed thy command. Now, verse 67 is where I want you to get. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I have kept thy word. Now, if you will, you skip the rest of that and jump on down for verse 71. Everybody read. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes, thy law. Hallelujah. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than 10,000s of gold and of silver. It, it was good that I was afflicted. All right, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. going to pick up, start reading at verse 1. It says, it is not expedient for me to doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. 
I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into where? Paradise. And heard unspeakable, undescribable, word, unrepeatable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in what? Mine affirmities or my afflictions. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a thief, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There were given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, now because of this, I would rather glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in, in infirmities and in reproaches and in necessities, in persecutions, in distress. For Christ's sake, for which I am weak, then I am strong. Amen. God bless. Father, again, we say thank you. You may be seated. Glory, 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 Hallelujah. Oh, great is thy faithfulness. Oh, God. My Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. For as thou hast been, thou forever shall be summer and winter and springtime and harvest sun moon and stars in the courses above join with only in a manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, your mercy and love. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see, and all I have needed, your hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Help me sing it one time. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see, and all I have needed, your hands have 
provided. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Lord, unto to me. Hallelujah. Come on and worship him. Hallelujah, great is, hallelujah, great is thy faithfulness, hallelujah, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, Lord, on to me, to me, to me, to me, to me. Never let me down. He said he's never let me down. Hallelujah. He's never failed me yet. Hallelujah. Not one time has he ever come short. Amen. I want to speak to you by the grace of God, the word that he has pushed into my heart is pulled into the light. Pulled into the light. The scriptures tell us that every man will declare his own goodness. We are all prone, um, whenever there is the times that I've had to do counseling with two people at the same time, or even individually, you know, you go in and whoever you're talking to, you will always tell your side of the story. Amen. And rarely in our version of the story are we the general. Rarely are we the bad guy. And so, but then the Bible says that, you know, a man will tell the story, but then his neighbor will come and straighten him out. Or the neighbor will come and tell the other side of the story. Because we have that propensity to tell our side of the story. The Bible tells us that God tells his people, he says, come, let us reason together. Amen. And he says that though your sins be as scarlet, and we take that sometimes that believing that we're going to go in and talk to God and we're going to reason and have the conversation. But in reality, when God says, come, let us reason together, God told the Jews, he said, I call heaven and earth to witness against you. He said, come, fill your mouth, bring your complaints. Job tried to do that. He pulled that stunt on God. Job said, if I could find him, I'd fill my mouth with complaints. I'd tell God how wrong he's been. And then, so in those last four chapters of the book of Job, God begins to explain to Job all the things that he did and he has done. And he asks Job, where were you when I created? Where were you when I did this? Where were you when I did that? When I hung the stars in the morning and they sang together. Where were you? Where do I keep the snow, Job? How, Job, how, how do I feed Leviathan and these great creatures? And how do I provide them fodder? And he asked Job all these questions, and finally Job says, I will put my hand over my mouth, and I will say nothing, and I will speak no more. Because whenever we try to reason with God, he has a way of shutting up our mouths. He has a way of putting us to silence. And it's a very interesting thing that when we go into God and pour our hearts out and we try to find fault in God, you told me or you said, and throughout Scripture you find people that will go to God and say, well, you said, and you did, and you promised, and the arguments that humanity has had with God is amazing. Adam had a discussion with God, and he wanted to make it God's fault. He literally said, this woman, he said, well, Adam, what is this you've done? This, this woman that you gave me, <laughs> he was your, I was up in here doing fine that you brought her up in here. Now, she done messed everything up, Amen. And Moses had this type of discussion with God in the mount when the people had committed sin. And God said, Moses, get down. Your people have corrupted themselves. And Moses said, well, these people of yours that you bought me to bring them out of Egypt, they're not my people, God. They're your people. 
And Moses wanted to disassociate himself from them because of that. And so throughout scripture, people have arguments and complaints and they, we want to reason with God and we want to discuss with God. But the problem is whenever God is always righteous, God is always good, God is perfect. Why? God is the arbitrator of truth. Amen. There is no lie in God. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither he the son of man that he should repent. God is never wrong. He's always righteous. He's always holy. Before he met you, he was holy. After you're dead, he'll still be holy. There are angels in heaven standing before his throne saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. They have been declaring that God is holy from the very eon of what we call time. And they have done so from eternity past and they will continue to do so into eternity future. Why? Because God is holy and God is righteous. You don't stand a chance standing before God arguing and trying to make your complaint. What you should do is bow before him and give him the glory that is due under his great name because it is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. I dare you to praise him right now. Hallelujah. And, and so in the text that we have this morning, we find uh, several or a couple of individuals that we'll talk about. The writer here in Psalms 119, he explains that, 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 that there was a transition in his life. And that transition was what he thought he was before and what he thought he was after. Before he went astray and before he was afflicted, he felt as if he was on good ground. He felt as if everything was all right. He felt like he had been keeping the word of God. But the Bible says that after I was afflicted, he said, but before I was afflicted, I realized that I had gone astray. I wasn't as right as I thought I was. And he said this affliction should literally knock some sin. Y'all remember when your mother and your father said, boy, I'll knock some sense into you. Amen. And we, then the next generation come along and said, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. And the same thought theology, the same thing was that we need to examine ourselves. And so the psalmist was saying that I went astray before I was afflicted. And then he said, but it was good that I was afflicted because it knocked some sense into me. Somebody praise him right now. And so in this same vein of this ideology or this theology or thought is where I believe we find the Apostle Paul. If you are a student of Scripture or if you study Scripture and you can see into the scriptures. What you will find is a very interesting thing about the Apostle Paul and, and about all of the people that walk with God. And it's no different with us that when we began our walk with God, there is sometimes a sort of arrogance. And, and, and you don't mean to be and you don't realize that you are. It, but it's because God doesn't reveal the greatness or the essence of who he is to you in the very beginning. It is a walk of where you're getting to know God. And, and, and it's necessary that you learn to spend time with God and in God's presence and, and in God's word. As we looked at last night, the Bible says that there were some that they, because of their lifestyle, it is proof that they never really knew God. It didn't mean that they never got saved, didn't mean that they got uh, baptized, didn't mean that they didn't have the Holy Ghost, but that word no means they never became intimate with God. 
Lord have mercy. Hallelujah. You see, there are folk that can get married and never get intimate. There are people who are married living in the same household, but they're literally, you can become a stranger to one another living under the same roof. It requires you to become intimate and intimate. Intimacy, it means that you have to open up and allow that person to see you in your vulnerabilities. Love, amen, real love causes us to accept people, my God, not as we would like for them to be, but as they are. And, and the reason why we like to hide ourselves is because we struggle with loving ourselves. Come on, somebody say amen. Now, unless you're arrogant and egotistical and narcissistic, narcissistic, then, you know, we all love ourselves to some degree. But, 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 but there are things in you and there are things about you that if everyone knew the innermost secrets of your heart, would you still feel the same way about me? as you do now. So love is a process, it, and, and you go through phases, and you go through changes, and if you do it as you should, you learn to fall more and more deeply in love as you learn to embrace the craziness that you married into. Uh, somebody say amen. Uh, Sister Harden tells me all the time I'm crazy. Amen. But I'm crazy because maybe that's what she was looking. The songwriter said, you right, I may be crazy, but it just might be a lunatic you were looking for. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody up in here. And, and so when you hang around together, you learn to appreciate one another's crazy. Ah, glory. Hallelujah. And, and, and so this is what it means to love, and, and, and we hide, and we don't want to be seen. But the problem with dealing with God is that God dwells in the light. Oh, uh, yeah. See, God doesn't dwell in the shadows. God, amen, though the light and the darkness are same to him, he does not dwell in darkness. Darkness is the abode of Satan and of the wicked people. The Bible tells us that there are a class and a group that evil men love darkness because why? Their deeds are evil evil. But if you're going to walk with God, you've got to learn how to walk in the light. But the problem with light is light makes manifest. Oh, glory be to God. So whenever I step into the light, it means that my mess becomes more and more visible. It means that the spot that's on my shirt that I didn't see when I was getting dressed is now visible when I step outside. It means the wrinkle of my tie, or it means that the little rip that I may not have noticed when I was getting dressed early in the morning in the dark, now it is visible. And that's what the Word of God and God does. God exposes you and we don't want to really be exposed, hallelujah. I want you to love the facade that I'm putting out there. And I want you to believe something about me, the image that I'm portraying and I'm putting out there. And many of you, you think you know me and I think I know you, but amen, if we were locked up in a room together for a long time, you might learn some stuff that you would say, oh, I didn't know he was like that. And, and I'm saying the same thing. I didn't know you were like that. Hallelujah to God. And this is where our young people struggle in marriage because they have been raised about being happy. And marriage is not about being happy. Come on, somebody say amen. That's not what it is about because happiness will change. You can be happy today and sad tomorrow. Your emotions are fickle. Hallelujah. You can pick up a newspaper and your disposition will change. But something that you read ain't got nothing to do with you. Come on, somebody. You can't trust your emotions. Being married means about falling in love. It means hanging in there through the rough time and the bad time. You said inside. 
sickness and in health. You said for better or for worse. You said for richer or poorer, but you didn't know he was going to get that broke. Now you're ready to walk out. You got to learn how to hang in there, baby. Hallelujah. You didn't know he smelled like that. You didn't come on up in here. You didn't know she was crazy a whole week out of every month. My God in heaven, what's wrong with this woman? That's not the baby that I married. Yes, it is. You're just finding out some stuff. Clap your hand and praise him up in here. It was there all the time, waiting patiently in line. <laughs> and after you got hooked, Lord have mercy. You see, this is why I like saved women. Ain't no surprise. Amen. You ain't going to go in and pull this off and take these off and wipe this off and, amen, let this out and go through all these changes. And she come out the bathroom and you say, where's my wife and what did you do with her? And who are you? Amen. Save women don't give you no false advertisement. Come on, y'all better hear me up in here. What you see ought to be what you... Y'all ain't saying nothing. Y'all ain't talking loud. Hallelujah. You didn't realize that was Korean up here. Huh? <laughs> Come on up in here. Lord have mercy. And so you're just... Mother laughing hard over here. You are discovering things about one another. And so in this passage, the Apostle Paul has come to a realization. As I said, when you examine this, you will start to see a transition in Paul's writing as he's walking with God. The book of 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and 1 Corinthians was written sometime around 55, 57 A.D., if my memory is correct. And so Paul had been saved for some 20, 22 years or so at the time of this writing, and he is going to die in about 9, 10 years from now. He is going to be martyred in Rome. So if you read Paul's earlier writings, you'll see a man that he's not braggadocious, but you see a man who is much more forceful. You will see someone who is, 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 is much more willing to put his opinion out there. You find the occasion, on um, um, two occasions that stand out to me was one in his dealing with young Timothy. Uh, uh, Timothy, being a young minister, had been traveling with Paul, and when Timothy found the work a little more difficult than he thought, he turned back. And the Apostle Paul did not like that. As a matter of fact, it caused some discourse between Paul and Barnabas because when they got ready to go on their next missionary trip, Barnabas wanted to take Timothy with him. And Paul said, no, we're not going to take him. But Barnabas was related to Timothy, and Paul said no. And the Bible says that the contentions between Paul and Barnabas were so strong that Barnabas went with Timothy and goes literally off the pages of biblical history. And then Paul picks up and he joins with Silas, and Silas becomes his partner. But Paul was so dogmatic about his stance at that point in time, he was not willing to give Timothy another chance. And this is what we do sometimes when we feel in our own perhaps arrogance or we feel that in our own way that, amen, that I'm going to have it my way or the highway because we haven't and we really don't know where this other individual is coming from. We can't allow ourselves to be empathetic with that person and put ourselves in their place. And Timothy was being young and inexperienced, but here is Paul. 
that he was a little bit of an older man. He had gone through some things, and he did not want to deal with this. But the beautiful thing about it is that later on in his ministry, he had began to write, and he told them, he said, come and see me and bring the books. And amen. At that point in time, he was beginning to feel that this individual was a little bit more profitable unto him in the ministry. And so this is, we see the change that is taking place in Paul. And then there is the other occasion that I find that when Peter had come down to Antioch and Peter had began to disassociate himself, the Apostle Paul, the Bible says, Paul said, I would stood him to his face. Paul was tough. Paul was, he was deliberate. Paul did not bite his tongue. He did not hold back. He was willing to call a, a spade a spade. Paul was really willing to put you in your place. He was willing to confront you and, and speak up and say whatever needs to be said. And there's no problem with that. But the Bible tells us to speak the truth in love. Uh, come on up in here. You see, we feel as if, well, I'm going to keep it real and I'm going to keep it 100. But what you will find is a lot of folk that keep it real and speak it, keep it 100, have a difficult time whenever that same 100 is spoken unto them. We have a difficult time in dealing with it when we are confronted with our own inadequacies. And so here Paul is writing to them at Corinth. And in writing to Corinth, the problem that he had with the Corinthian church was that the Corinthian church did not respect Paul for all the things that he had done. Paul was the one that had gone to Corinth and preached to them, but yet some other individuals had come in and started preaching and teaching. And the Corinthian church was a very carnal church, though they were very spiritually gifted, they were still a very carnal church. They were sectarian. Paul said, "Some of you are of," uh, uh, he said, "Some of you all of Barnabas. Some of you are uh, of, of Cephas, of Paul. I mean, I'm sorry, of Peter. And some of you, you have these fractions, and you only want to listen to certain ones and deal with certain people." Paul said, "No, that's not the way it is." And he told them he he got on them for the way they were even having communion. He said, "You come together to eat the Lord's supper, and you got folk in your midst." who are hungry, amen, and some of you are drunkards, and they had a love feast, and they were in the church, and they were drinking. They weren't taking the little sips. Come on, y'all hear me. They weren't passing out no little cups, amen, but they were turning it up, baby. Hallelujah to God. And, and, and the problem was that in the early church and among the Jewish people, people will argue about you with you about drinking wine. Well, you've got to understand how the Jews drunk wine. It was always cut with water. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. And even when they drank, it was mostly water upwards of 10 to 30 percent water, or not percent, but 10 to 30 percent part water to wine. So that meant every cup of wine, you might have 10 cups of water or 30 cups of water to cut it. So it's almost like you taking meal or one of these little bottles of squirt juice and squirting it in your water to give it a little flavor. They weren't drinking it socially to get drunk. So when they did this within the church, Paul was blown away by this. He said, you're drunk in the church? My God. God in heaven. He said, that just ain't right. And so he did these things and spoke to them, and they rejected his leadership and his headship. And so in the meantime, Paul had been going through some situations of his own, and Paul had been dealing with some things. And so this is where we arrive here in chapter 12. And Paul begins to tell this story, and in the beginning, it sounds as if he is talking about someone else, but he's not. He is talking about himself, but he uses a form of writing that rather than expose or put himself out there and talk about himself, he it seems to be talking about someone else because he did not want the glory. 
my God in heaven. So Paul says, I knew a man about 14 years ago. Well, that man was Paul. And he goes on to tell them, he said, that the experience that he had, he said, I can't tell you whether it was in the body or out of the body. I don't know if it was a vision. I don't know if I was really caught up into the third heaven. But he said, but this man saw some things that were so wonderful, so indescribable, so awesome, my God in heaven. He says, there's no way that I could convey these things to you. You doubt my apostleship. You doubt whether or not God is using me. And I've seen stuff that I can't even talk to you about. I've seen things that I can't even describe to you. You cannot imagine what God has revealed to me. Paul said it like this. He tells them, he speaks to, not to them, but I believe it was in the book of Galatians. When Paul is talking about himself, he said the gospel, the message that I received he said, it didn't come from a man. He said, I hadn't even seen the apostles. When God called me, I go into Arabia, and I'm there for three years, and God revealed this to me. He saw the Lord, the incarnate Christ, even after his resurrection and ascension. Paul said, I saw him. That's why he could declare he was an apostle. We got folk running around hollering about being an apostle, but one of the qualifications was you had to see the Lord. Somebody say amen. So everybody's looking for titles and everybody's looking for accreditation. But Paul says of his own self, he said, I've been there. I've seen him. I've experienced it. I know what I'm talking about. And he told them, he said, if I'm not an apostle to anybody, he said, I am to you. You are my handiwork in the Lord. Some of you sitting in here right now, if it had not been for God using Pastor Price in these last few years. My God, where would you be? Some of you right now ought to give God a praise and say thank you, Lord, for using her to help us through this transition. Your heart was broken. You wondered perhaps how, but God has been merciful, and you ought to give God a praise for your leadership, and you ought to say, Lord, we thank you for what you've done. There is a spirit in here, my God. God in heaven, that God has placed his stamp of approval upon it. I'm going to hold on and give you some time to say amen. Sometimes it'll come slow, but it'll come. Ah, yes. And so Paul is dealing with this. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hallelujah. We, we, we've got a different church than we've had in, in the, over the last 30 or 40 years. Amen. Over the last 30 or 40 years, our ideology of what a pastor is has changed. In the early church and in the last 30 or 40 years, we understood we needed pastors. Come on, y'all ain't saying nothing to me. But we've come to the place in this new church. And we believe we can do it on our own. We can make it by ourselves. This is why we struggle to get folk back to church. I understand you sick. I understand something's going on. I understand. But we've come to the time where it's inconvenient for me to get up, take a shower, put on clothes, drive 10, 15, 20 miles, and go to church when I can just sit at home and watch it. But that's different, baby. You see, you cannot engage in front of your TV. You're sitting on your couch eating potato chips. You're you sitting on your couch in your pajamas. You sitting in your couch hollering at your kids. You need to be in the house of God where you can fellowship with the saints of God. It's not just about being there. It's about fellowship. We were not made to be solitary animals. We weren't meant to be lone wolf McCade. We were meant, my God, you are a part of an organism. If you cut off your finger, you will still operate without it, but it's awkward to work and do certain things. It's awkward in the church when a part of the body is absent and missing. I know I'm meddling. But it ain't got nothing to do with that. We've just become comfortable and we like convenience uh, all I know is if it was convenient Jesus would have never went to the cross 
If it was convenient, he would have never stepped off the throne and unrobed himself and laid his glory down and took upon himself the likeness of sinful man. If it was convenient, he would have not took on your sins, but he said, my will, not mine, but thine be done. And he did an inconvenient thing. So how come I can't be inconvenienced in my service to him? We don't mind being inconvenienced for $20, $25, $30 an hour on the job. But we get inconvenienced at church. It's too much of an effort. It's too much of a struggle. Lord have mercy. I'm still preaching. We're going to get into pulled into the light in just a moment. And so Paul is having to discuss some things that he would rather have been silent about. He has to talk about some stuff that he wanted to be quiet about because that transition that it took place in him had humbled him. And though he does not articulate what it was, he gives us some indication. He said, because of this wonderful revelation that had been given unto me, he said, there was allowed by God, amen, the, an affliction to affect me. He says that it was there, and the reason why was so that I could not be exalted above measure. And when I looked at this in the beginning and earlier on in the week, my assumption was that God wanted me to deal with verse 9. But then this morning as I sit here, God drew my attention into the fact that Paul said, I would be a fool to glory in himself. And that was the thing that broke me down because I did not realize the focus was on that verse and not on the other. And as I sit and I listen, and I'm so glad that my membership was here because as they spoke concerning me, my God in heaven, sometimes something in your mind will stir up about what you was do and what you have done and what you can do. But then I started to realize that I would be a fool to take glory in anything that God has wrought in me. And then the reality of what Paul was dealing with began to settle in. Paul began to tell them, and he speaks to them and said that the thorn that was in my flesh, it was the work of Satan to buffet me back and forth to keep me from coming, becoming too proud. It was God allowing Satan to have access to my life. And there was an internal struggle that had been going, in, uh, going on in the Apostle Paul. I'm of the mindset that what Paul was dealing with was perhaps a personal failure in his own life or a tendency or, or proclivity to be led in the wrong direction. And you would say, why do you believe that, Pastor? Because of what he wrote in Romans chapter 7. Paul said that when I would do good, he said, I find another law working in my members. He said that whenever I wanted to live right, he said, I found that there was something in me that wanted to compel me to go in the wrong direction. Hallelujah to God. And that was the constant ongoing struggle. And every saint that's sitting in here, I don't care how good you have lived. I don't care how holy you are. I don't care how long you you pray. I don't care about how much tongues you can speak and in how many different languages. If you will be honest with yourself, there is an eternal struggle that is going on down inside of you that you don't want nobody to talk about and you don't want anybody to see. And if you say, well, that's not happening with me, then it must be because you have not been pulled in 
into the light of God because here's what happened to Isaiah. Isaiah said that in the day that Uzziah died, he said, I saw the Lord. Come on and help me, my brother. And he said that when I saw the Lord, I started to recognize that I was undone. But before he saw the Lord, he felt all right. Before he got close to God, he felt like he was living and he was okay. But when he stepped into presence of God and moved into his light, all of a sudden, the light of God's holiness began to show the spots and the stains and the mess that was on his garments. And he said, I'm undone. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. And as a matter of fact, I now realize that every and all the people that are around me, I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. I'm not saying you're not holy. I'm not saying you're not living right. And I'm not saying, hallelujah, that you're in gross sin. But I'm telling you that there is a struggle in you that you cannot overcome except you get the help of the Lord God Almighty. There is a depth in you that you're hiding in the darkness. But because God loves you and because God wants you. He's willing to pull you into the light. I know you don't want to go. I know you don't want to be exposed. I know you hate it. I know you don't like that side of you. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know that you try to keep it down. But every now and then, some mess in you will raise its ugly head. And you got to say, woe is me, because I am a wretch. And that's what Paul says in chapter 7. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? from this dead body. He said, I'm struggling in it. I want to get out of it. I want to defeat it. I want to break it. I want to destroy it. He said, but everywhere I go, I'm wrestling in my mind. I'm wrestling in my bed. And it doesn't matter. You might have a good job. You may be driving a fine car. You may be living at the right address. You're wearing all the right clothes. You're saying all the right things. You're connected to all the right people. But there is some mess in you that God is trying. Come on, help me. That God is pulling into the light. Because God's not interested in your money. God's not interested in your position. God is not interested in how long you've been saved. What God is interested in is making you holy. And the only way he can get you holy is to pull you into the light. Oh, but we don't want to go into the light. I don't want you to see me as I really am. I don't want you to see my brokenness. I don't want you to see me act like that. So when I come to church, I act in my best behavior. I'm going to act and talk and say and do to the best of my ability. Oh, because why? In the church, we're trying to walk in the light. But oh, when we step out of the church and get into the parking lot, we ready to fuss somebody out because they cut me off. You trying to get in the mall and you saying, I wish he would cut in front of me. You get some change at Walmart and they short you a dollar and you say you didn't give me the right change and that woman say yes I did and baby you don't put your hand on your hip and started wagging your head you don't want another saint to see you act like that but God will pull you into the light because he said I'm going to clean you I'm going to shrug a scrub you I'm going to show you your mess I'm going to let you see it from time to time so that you can give me the praise and say if it had not been for God if it were not the Lord I think
thank God for the Holy Ghost. I thank God for being saved. And then you go back and you fast. You go back and you pray. You go back and study. Why? Because you're trying to bring it back under. And you do good. But in a few days, it'll rear its ugly head. And you say, Lord, help me to deal with me. It's not my mama. It's not my daddy. It's not my sister. It's not my brother. But it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's not your wife. It's your short temper. It's not your child. You just a bad parent. It is not the man you work with. You don't know how to work with people. And God pulls you into the light, tells you to shut your mouth. He tells you to sit down somewhere. He tells you to gird it up and deal with it because I'm pulling you into the light. Somebody praise him. Say, Lord, bring me out of darkness. Lord, bring me out of my shame. Lord, bring me out of my mess. Pull me into your light so that I can have fellowship, me and you. A sweet hour of prayer that you can break up my stubborn heart. You can break up my contrary mind. That you can deliver me not from my problem, but deliver me from myself. Somebody pray him in here. Yeah. Come on and praise him, yeah. Come on and praise him, yeah. I know, I know, I know. You want to shout about the new house you're getting. We want to shout about the new car we're driving. We want to shout about the job God's going to give me next week. But Paul said, I will glory in my infirmity. I will glory in my weakness. I will glory in my necessity. Because when I am weak, God will make me strong. When I fail, God will pick me up. I I'm excited about getting close to God. If I never get the car, if I never get the house, if I never get the job, if I never get the money, I got Jesus, and that's all right with me. Somebody praise him in here. Pull me. into the light, we don't realize that you're not going to be judged. As a saint of God, you're being judged right now. Judgment begins can iron out the wrinkles. He said no wrinkle, no spot, no blemish, no something. Well, he can only do that if he can pull you into the light. The Laodicean church of Revelations chapter 3, the Bible says we are rich and we are increased with good. And we have no need of nothing. We don't have to pray now because we have life insurance. We make fun of the old folks because they had a herb and a potion and a lotion for everything. They didn't have health insurance. And they trusted in God. We've got health insurance. 
we don't even have to pray. We've got more food. We let food go bad. You got chicken and stuff in your refrigerator, in your freezer. You got pantries. We've got cabinets. My God. Some of you sitting in here, the most of your life you were raised on beans. Somebody talk to me. I don't like hash. My mother would cook a roast, and then the next day she'd put it in the pan and put some potatoes and some carrots, and that beef done broke down, and you can't even see if there's beef in there or not. She called it hash. We can go out and eat anywhere. Our kids tell us where they want to eat. And on the way home, you got to stop at four or three or four different restaurants because one of your kids want McDonald's and another one of your kids want Dairy Queen and somebody else want pizza and we making all these stops and we don't even stop to give God praise and say thank you. You had one Sunday go to meeting suit and a couple of dresses And if you wore it on Monday, you had to wash it so that you could wear it on Wednesday. And God has blessed us. And we have the audacity to sit in God's house and not be able to come up with a praise. Let him pull you into the light and you will thank God for every, the Bible says, for every hungry soul, every morsel is precious. Every morsel, every crumb is precious. And we have come to that place where we've become rich. And we don't know how to praise him sometimes. But oh, but when he pulls you into the light, you can praise him just because of who he is. We used to sing, ah, hallelujah, I saw the light. And when you see the light, that's reason enough to give God praise. That's reason enough to go off. That's reason enough to go crazy. We got to have a reason to praise him. But, oh, but when he pulls you into his light, you don't have to have a reason. You just happy you got him. Amen. When I see Jesus, and these type of messages don't usually go over well in the church because we have so many other things. We have so much, and we've got so much. But as these things begin to come, and I believe that our culture is headed to a down time, and the reason why for us that these things will come is because it's a way of God bringing us and centering us and pulling us into the light. Israel got a measure of God when they went into Canaan. And when they went into Canaan and they had fought and they had struggled and they fought and they had struggled for years, but finally they came to the place where they wouldn't fight anymore. And so Joshua tells them, and in the book of Judges, Joshua tells them in chapter 23, and it's repeated in the book of Judges, God said, I will need no more drive out the inhabitants of the land before you. See, God said, I will drive them out, but you've got to do the fight. He said, but I'll go before you. Now, have you ever seen a fixed fight? Some of you that watch basketball, I want you to watch the uh, Golden State Warriors. Watch them. See, I don't trust the NBA. I like that. See, I, I, I'm a conspiracy theorist. I, I don't trust the NBA, the NFL. I believe a lot of this stuff is fixed. 
And if you will watch the Golden State Warriors, they're not happy. Because I believe they should be winning, but I believe somebody told them you got to lose. So they're struggling to get in the playoffs. Well, I'm the best player on the team. So what? They're happy. Because they've gotten word from someone else that they can't win. Now, see, if you really understood what Satan is so upset about, is because God took your thunder. He's already been defeated. He already knows he's got to lose. And so the fight has been fixed on your behalf. But you still have to get in the ring. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Somebody help me with this. You're going to get in the ring, but you're going to win. It's already been written in the script. Okay. And so as you're fighting in Judah's script, and as the children of Israel had to fight, they got complacent. They wouldn't fight no more. And so in the 21st chapter, I believe, in the book of Joshua, God tells them, I will no more drive them out before you. He said, if you're not willing to fight for your cause, I will no longer fight for you. And so in the book of Judges, you see them going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, from victory to defeat. Why? Because God was no longer going before them. He was letting them have their way. We've been doing a study on the parable of the sower. That was the first parable that Jesus gave. And he said that the reason why I'm giving this parable is because I have been teaching and teaching for these years, but they have not understood. I have shown them enough that they should believe that I am their Messiah. So he said from this point forward, the disciples said, why are you not teaching the parable? He said, because it's given unto you to know the mystery. He said, but no longer is it going to be given to them. He said, so I'm going to speak to them, and they're not going to know it. We can come to church, and we can hear the word preached. But if we don't utilize it, somebody talk back to me. If you don't grasp it, you see, you think you can get saved when you get ready. Not if God hides it from you. See, you telling mom and daddy, oh, don't bother me with that. When I get ready, I'm going to get saved. It's not when you get ready. It's when God is calling you. No man can come except what? He be drawn to come. And so God said, I'm no longer going to fight. I'm no longer going to drive them out. He said, I'm going to lead them, and they're going to be snares and traps and thorns in your side. And they're going to mess with you. And so for the rest of the Jewish people in the land of Canaan, they had walked out of the land. They would go into captivity. They had prayed, and God would deliver them. And in two years, they'd go right back. They'd go back into captivity. They would cry. God would raise up a judge and deliver them but he never brought them complete victory. The closest they got was under the reign of David. But they never got the full victory in the land they should have had. Why? Because they would not walk in the light when they had it. He said, if you will walk in my statutes and my judgments and walk in my light, he said, one of you will chase a thousand and two of you will put 10,000 to flight. That's what it means when you walk in the light. You didn't get that job because of your education. You got it because God wanted to bless you. You're not living where you're living because of your effort. You're there because God placed you there. And when he gets ready, he can take it away. You didn't survive that condition because of the doctor. You survived because the Lord said live when you should have died. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I dare not become so arrogant within myself to think that I am anything. Hallelujah. He said I would be a fool 
if I gloried in myself. It's the spirit of Satan. He said, I will ascend. I will do this. I, I, I. And God said, you shall be thrown down. And every one of you sitting in here right now, you're sitting here because of the grace and the mercy of God. You are one breath away from eternity. Hallelujah. You're planning what you're going to do for the next 25 years. But if God withdraws your next breath, you will creel over right where you are and end up in a devil's hell. You ought to thank God and say, today is my day of salvation. Today is my day of coming out. Today is my day of getting over. Today is my day of giving God the praise that he deserves from me. I'm making it up in my mind that as of today, I'm getting a fresh new start. Can we say we're going to wait? Wait for what? There was something that I forgot to share with you all last night. I'm drawing this to a close. Do you know the probability of you being who you are is so astronomical it could not even be calculated? The chances of you being born and being who you are is so phenomenal. The word seed that we looked at last night is the Latin word sperma. Do you know what that means? Do you know that there are between 100 and 200 million sperma released at one time? And do you realize that the woman that dispenses one egg per month, sometimes more per month, and the chances of the one sperm of those millions connecting with that one egg that month is so astronomical that if it missed, you wouldn't even be here right now. We used to believe that the sperm, the first sperm that made it to the egg was the one that inseminated. They're now discovering that that's not true. They're now discovering that the sperm that the egg chooses to, there is something in the mechanism, they don't even know how it's done, but that egg has to allow that sperma to enter the egg to fertilize it. So there was other sperma that made it to the egg before yours did. But God shut those out because he wanted That's why he said, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And because I knew you, I brought you forth. He says, you are mine. Come on, somebody. You are mine. <laughs> Hallelujah. You are mine. I chose you. And I brought you out because you are mine. And because I'm his, he's pulling me into the light. He didn't bring me in here to leave me. He didn't bring me in here to fail. He didn't bring me in here to come short. He didn't bring me in here to commit suicide. But he brought me in here to wash me and cleanse me and bring me unto himself. I am his, and he is mine. Glory, and one day, the clouds are going to open. He's going to call me up, and I'm going to join him in the air, and so shall I ever, I ever, I ever be with the Lord. His pleasure. You 
were created. And he founds pleasure in you. And he says, but I got to pull you in the light. I got I to pull you into the light. I got I to gotta, I gotta let you see what's there. And it's not until he pulls you into the light and you see what you are that you will cooperate with the working of his spirit. It's a collaborative effort. You are his handiwork, created under the image of Christ. And he is working the plan over the time into the image of what he designed you to be. But he pulling you. Everyone stand with me as we get ready. He's pulling you. You've said it once. You've said it twice. You've said it before. You've said one day. You've said next week. You've said Sunday. And you've kept saying all this time, I'm going to start this on Friday. I'm finishing it on Saturday. I'm saving it for Sunday. But you know what? What have you had enough to do? And so as I get ready to turn this over to you, Pastor, no longer going to hide in the shadow. And I'm not saying you're in darkness. I'm saying that you, sometimes you like to hide in the shadow. You don't want to be exposed. And he said, I'm not going to let you hide. I'm going to let you hide. I'm going to let you hide. Go ahead and let me hide. He said, but I'm not only going to let you hide. his drug use and the problems and the things that he went through and he shares this stuff at home and Sister Yvonne does as well. But when I look at the work that God has done in their life, I say this in passing, is that there are some people that you will talk to and when they share their testimony, you look at them and you say, there's no way in the world I can believe that you were ever like that. that the Lord has done in my life. And I don't look like what I've been through. But when you meet someone and they tell you their story and you walk away and you say, I can see that. I, I, I used to rob people and cut heads off and everything. Yeah, I can see that. some vestige of that there. But when they can look at you and they can tell and they say, I, 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 I no way. You, you can't be the person you're talking about. And you're going to stand there and say, well, yeah, I, I made some changes in my life. No, God. You ought to say, but God did the unbidden because he pulled me into his marvelous 